Hi, Doug Patterson, AI Tech Defense Systems. Um, going to give you a short talk today about uh, COTS in space. I know it sounds like something right out of the Muppet Show, COTS in space, but that's what I'm talking about. Conceptually speaking, what I'm talking about is what is meant by space. I know, hang on a sec, everybody knows what space is. Everybody who's watched Fireball XR5 or Space Ghost knows what space is, so just hang with me for a sec. Um, the platform applications that reside within those, uh, those markets, uh, the Earth orbits, they actually are quite different, and I'll give you a quick overview. Some of the misconceptions that are floating around out there, um, floating around is in air quotes there, understanding the needs of the space market and some of the products that are available. Okay, so what's meant by space? I know, grown, work with me. So actually, I didn't know this until I actually went and looked at it, because I thought space was anything that was a couple hundred miles up from the Earth's surface, up and out until forever. But it's actually defined as uh, 100 kilometers above the Earth, which is about 62,000 or so uh, miles above the Earth. And it's um, characterized by a very high vacuum and lots of particle radiation, whether that's caused by solar wind or cosmic rays or supernova or whatever it is, that they're all floating around out there. And obviously it contains a whole lot of different kinds of environments out there that actually makes a difference when you talk, start talking about deep space, deep space meaning beyond the moon's orbit and out to the planets. Um, in terms of the environments themselves in the Earth's orbit, there are a number of craft and, mark and applications that reside there. Talking now, um, breaking my own rule and saying I like to stay within the definitions, but talking about Earth's orbit, which a lot of people characterize and talk about as being space anyway. So we'll just kind of hang with that for a moment. There's lots of different applications. There's a lots of different ways the or orbits are characterized and the altitudes above the Earth and the kinds of things that reside in there. Um, if you look at ISS, um, that is about 250 some odd miles above the Earth. Uh, it is obviously uh, inhabited. And uh, there are lots of experiments and a lot of systems on that that are VME. 6U VME and 3U Compact PCI are littered literally all over the station. Um, just as a small fun fact, we have roughly 100, 100 plus uh, Motorola 68040-based single-board computers and Ethernet hubs on ISS running the Express Rack program. Express Rack being a standardized mechanical and, and electrical interface that allows people to develop experiments on the ground, fly them up and plug them in, and then the rack runs the experiment for the space station autonomously, all connected by Ethernet networks. Um, so you have satellites, low Earth orbit satellites, and you have satellites and const constellation clusters of satellites, and then you have experimental spacecraft that are going up there and don't even really attain orbit. They go into an elliptical orbit and then come right back down again. Or you have uh, space platforms up there that are weapons platforms that are actually up there today. What are the definitions of the orbits? You've got LEO, which is low Earth orbit, MEO, medium Earth, geostationary Earth, which is 22,000 miles up. That's where something is in a fixed position over the Earth as the Earth rotates. So a lot of the GPS, a lot of the kinds of satellites that are up there currently today are up in geostationary, a lot of communication satellites. Uh, and then you have high Earth orbit, which is above geo and into deep space. Um, the little graph on the side there just gives you a relative idea of what is where. I added the Sirius XM radio constellations because just about everybody's got one of those in their car now. And that sits up about 22 miles also. What is not widely known, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway, is that the velocities of maintaining an orbit, the, the closer you are to the Earth, the velocity of the object that's in Earth's orbit has to be rotating faster because it has the centripetal forces. In order to maintain that orbit, it has to go at higher velocities as you get closer to the Earth. So the space station, ISS, is, is roughly um, about 17,000 miles per hour relative to a position on Earth. A lot of people don't know that. Um, as you get further and further out, the speeds get lower because the forces get lower. Um, but that what happens is that in those orbits, uh, the ISS space station uh, actually has to change its orbits three or four times a year. Not many people know that either, in order to avoid the junk that's floating around out there. So rather than ripping through it, it will, they have to move it. And they get very clever sometimes how they have to move it. Uh, sometimes the engines aren't 
uh, powerful enough on ISS to actually move it, so they use the engine on whatever happens to be docked to the space station, like Soyuz or the shuttle or whatever, in order to help push it up out of, out of orbit, out of the stuff that's flying through. So, uh, most everybody knows about the Van Allen belts. Um, pretty well defined, uh, this picture shows them. They're all very pretty, very, very uh, uh, regular patterns, and it gives you an idea of what's going on. Uh, in terms of orbits, very important that you understand that it's not just the orbit, it depends on the angle of inclination of the orbit. The reason I say that is because if you're in equatorial orbit, you're pretty much in the same Van Allen belt, and you're very well protected from particles from space. If you go into the polar orbit, that's where the Van Allen belt is actually open at the top. And the amount of radiation that pours in through there can be 100 to 1,000 times more than it is around the equator. So the systems that you put up in space have to have certain um, safeties and certain types of components to keep them from becoming either uh, to have a single event upset or a single event latch up. When it goes into latch up, it tends to kind of burn itself up and go away. So that's very important. But those Van Allen belts don't look like that. So what happens is during uh, the solar wind, and whether you have solar flares, it actually pushes the Van Allen belts out of the way. And that's what you see when the northern lights, as those particles start to stream out past and then go bound into the poles. That's why the North Pole and the South Pole have the uh, auroras. So there's a lot of particles out there, a lot of uh, charged ions, a lot of things that will do a lot of damage to whatever electronics you happen to have floating around up there. There's something else that's floating around there, up there, which not a lot of people know about. It's the Southern Atlantic Anomaly, right off the coast of uh, South America. This is where every time the ISS flies through it, and it flies through at, a, at, a, at an angle, and as it flies through um, doing roughly 17,000, or about five miles a second, the, every time it goes through this, this hole in the Earth's magnetic field, all the electronic systems basically go south. They, they stop working. All ground communications would stop. This was in the past, but not too, far, not too long ago, where uh, all the switches and routers uh, that were up there would just stop working. So the station would go quiet every time they went through this patch of, of the hole in the, uh, in the uh, Van Allen belt. So uh, what they've done is they've actually replaced a lot of the switches and routers with radiation tolerant or, and or rad hard switches. And uh, we've been lucky enough to actually secure their contract. Okay, this, this, is the, this is the tough one, junk. There is a lot of it up there, and a lot of people are trying to figure out ways of actually uh, getting rid of it. There are thousands, and next slide talks about the kind of quantities, but there's thousands and millions of things floating around out there. Screws, nuts, washers, wrenches, tools, uh, paint flakes. I mean, what's the big deal about a paint flake, right? I mean, a little chunk of paint, a centimeter. Well, that happens to be traveling at about 40,000 miles an hour, and if that hits a window of the space shuttle or any other system, it goes right through it. So, the wind, that's why the windows on the space shuttle are extremely well uh, produced. There actually have been, if you've seen some of the pictures of the shuttle when it came, comes back, it's like somebody took a gun and pff, tried to shoot through the window, that, and that was a paint flake that did that. Uh, micrometeor, ords, micrometeoroids, and there's weapons platforms up there that nobody's talking about and that, uh, from other countries. So, it's an issue. Um, so the Air Force is tracking about 1,500 active satellites that are 220 pounds or, or more. Um, 29,000 man-made objects, these are the hand tools and nuts and bolts and screws and washers. Um, over 670,000 of them are between 1 and 10 centimeters, and 170 million pieces of crap, really, are 3 millimeters to a centimeter. That's a lot of stuff, and the graph gives you kind of a rough idea of what orbits that stuff is floating around in. There's a lot of known effects called the Kessler effect. That's where a number of things keep colliding with each other and it actually creates more junk. So exponentially, the amount of junk that's potentially flying around, around the Earth is going to landlock us, if we're not careful. So a lot of people are trying to figure out ways to get rid of that stuff. Um, in terms of the market per, uh, itself, the private sector today, is driving uh, the satellite uh, for Earth imagery and communications. Uh, it used to be the military satellites, you know, the one-off, $1 billion, $500 million satellites used to be the market. 
it has completely turned itself upside down. So customers are out there, startups are putting satellites up in orbit into low Earth orbit, are creating constellations, 20, 30, 40 satellite constellations. You've got uh, OneWeb slash Google, Amazon, who are actively designing to put up 1,000 satellites to provide internet to the world. Global internet access, I kind of talked about that a little bit. 2017, only 52% of the world had internet access. Um, and a little interesting tidbit, I, th I found that 10 new unique website uh, hosts are being added about to the internet every two and a half seconds. So I charts down here below to look at, but that um, what this clearly shows is, the, is that the commercial satellite market is the, is the market sector that's growing the, growing the most. Okay, this gets into the hard part. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but when it comes down to the component selection, what are the kind of boards and products, whether it's 3U Compact PCI, whether it's 3U VPX, whether it's 6U VME, what's really the big deal about what goes on it? It's the selection of the components that goes on it and the characterization of the components. Uh, NASA has, uh, I think, on one of these slides I, I put in that, uh, NASA has a rule, is you, you test what you fly and you fly what you test. They will not have any more failures caused by, well, we made a little change in the software after we launched and knew. No, NASA says, no more failures. Test what you fly, fly what you test. So, um, what, why would you select components? Obviously, there's a lot of different types of components. There's commercial ICs, COTS ICs, um, radiation enhanced ICs that have a little better radiation tolerance and are radiation hardened. And this gives you roughly an idea of the kinds of characterizations of those components in terms of rad silicon, how many uh, MeV or millions of electron volts it takes to actually put the part into either a single event latch up, which is unrecoverable. The part latches up and it's gone unless you have mitigation cir circuitry either on the card or in the power supply to catch that and reset it. Or single event upset, which is uh, memory chips, flash chips, they'll just be happily running along, a particle will come in and upset one of the flip-flops and it just brrt, brrt, and it flops. You have to detect that and make sure you catch it and then the system just resets and takes over and runs like it wants to. Some of the commercial parts that we've tested, we've taken it out to the cyclotrons and uh, some of these parts are failing at 20, 30, 40, maybe 400 rads. That is about the amount of radiation you'll get in a normal launch, a booster launch between uh, ground and uh, by the time it reaches orbit. It could accumulate maybe, depending on the orbit and the inclination, it could accumulate about 400 rads. And those parts will just die. They're, they're the, uh, the silicone, the structure, the crystalline structure within the part is changed to the point where it won't function anymore. Uh, there's other parts that are radiation hardened. Uh, a lot of companies, there's a big company called BAE Systems, they down to Manassas, they produce the Rad Hard Power PC. And just to put it in context, a Power PC parts, maybe a couple hundred bucks that you can buy on the open market for free scale. From BAE Systems, it starts at $150,000 per chip. So, it just gives you kind of an idea of what you're talking about in terms of cost. So, what else is going on out there? Isn't that picture a surprise? We order a capacitor, a space capacitor, and expect it to be a capacitor. And we noticed that the value was wrong because we got a little more ripple on the power supply than we noticed. Okay, now what? So we took the part apart. And we found that from one of our distributors, that's what was inside. It's a 3800 or what was it, 6800 microfarad capacitor inside the parts of 2200. They couldn't even match the capacitance. <laughs> Come on. That's real, and that happens. So there's a lot of different levels of parts. There's a NASA standard called INST002, 003 is the latest rev, and it's available online. Just do a Google search and you can download it. It clearly defines the kind of triple E parts, electrical, electronic, electromechanical parts that you can use within your systems based on the reliability of the system, the mission length, um, and the amount of dosage and the amount of radiation and, that you're expected. So all of those factors come in to define what kinds of parts you can use and what can you can expect. However, you can't just go by the data sheets because NASA won't take it. You have to go and test it. So just because you have a data sheet from a data, from a, and if you're lucky enough to have a component vendor actually characterize the part for rad silicon, 
It's not acceptable. You have to go get your own data. You have to prove it. So the kinds of applications that are out there, actually a lot larger than I ever thought as I started thinking about it and started putting applications and customers coming back to us. You got C and DH, that's command and data handling computers, propulsion and flight control. You have um, autonomous systems, uh, robotics and, and um, arm manipulation systems that are out there. Uh, the Hubble service um, Dexter program, which is a, a robot arm. Uh, OSIRIS-REx, which is a robotics platform. Orbital Express, which is a fully autonomous robotic platform. 100% uh, successful, by the way. Uh, it's essentially a service station up in space. It actually docks with a satellite. It pulls out the hydrazine, replaces the fuel, uh, the spent fuel with refuel, and actually can change out the mission computer itself with a robotic arm, a system called Astro. Um, altitude um, and attitude control. Uh, thank you, Jenna. Um, for systems that, that control how things are uh, relative spatially in, in space and how that is controlled. It's actually quite, quite sophisticated and quite simple. You, you think there's gyroscopes and all that other stuff. No, it's simple torque rods, which is a rod stuck to the side of the satellite and a rotating actuator that actually puts tension on the torque rod and the satellite turns with it and then you turn it off and the satellite stops. So it's actually pretty, inter pretty interesting. Um, so lots of stages, lots of booster stages, the applications for those. This is where you don't really need rad hard parts. COTS parts are fine because you're only actually operating the system for what, maybe 10, 15 minutes tops and then it's done. Unfortunately, what done means is it's still in orbit. If um, you go and look at some of the applications that are out there, I think one of them is called Skyview. And if you download that to your, to your phone and you look in the Southern hemisphere, you will see literally hundreds of boosters just sitting out there in space that you have to dodge each one of them as you try to launch something. So lots of different applications. Uh, customer demands and trends, this is what we're seeing. Uh, today, launch costs are about $10,000 a pound. Customers want $1,000 a pound. Uh, just like in the defense and aerospace market today, for COTS, it's swap C. They want smaller, lighter weight, and lower power and lower cost. So <clears throat> what is COTS in space? I mean, really, what's, what's the definition? There it is. Cots in space. OK, it's probably not that. Thank you, Simon Group. Right, lots of different types of boards and products. Now, you're going to look at these and go, they look the same as what I see when I'm in the defense and aerospace market. In some cases, they are very, very similar. It's just the components and the quality of components and the cost associated with building each one of these cards. Some of them have uh, much larger heat sinks on them. That's for shielding. That's for um, actually providing some shielding from heavy ion particles to get, um, I could say it's about 10,000 or so rads for every oh, half inch of aluminum. So sometimes these boards are very heavy and they've got a very thick heat sink because that's what the customer asks for. Because they want additional shielding because depending on where the system's located in the satellite, it could be out toward the skin or it could be uh, mounted inside the, uh, closer to the, the, the system bus and the core of the satellite, which means that it has much less incoming radiation to deal with. 